So I'm getting more annoyed. And I'm like, Joel, what have you done? You put it's, It won't come off, you know. This is a real problem. This isn't even my computer. It's the church's computer. It's God's computer. Welcome to the second episode in our Kingdom Centric series and today we're looking at the gospel. What does a Christian centric gospel look like? What does a Kingdom Centric gospel look like and which one have you embraced? Uh, last week I talked a little bit about my story and uh, how I became a Christian. I think I, I mentioned I went into schools and as I started to go into schools what I realized was that young people wouldn't become Christians or wouldn't find out more about God unless there was somebody in the church that they could go and find out a bit more details. And so in 1992, we started the first ever PAYS team. There were five of us uh, reaching into schools and each one of us created a relational connection between a different school and the church that we were based in. And since then, we've started this uh, free apprenticeship. And I think I mentioned this last year as well, where we offer a gap year, a two-year apprenticeship in leadership development, a three-year ministry development year. Uh, all of them include accommodation, training, and meals for free. And the reason we do that is to get as many people as we can on the mission field, so as many people as possible hear the gospel. And so um, it grew which was great. And this is me many, many years ago leading pays in the UK. Uh, and so we started in England. Uh, now we're in these nations around the world. And it's been a, kind of a, a crazy story, really, just uh, seeing what's happened pre-COVID. Here's a couple of pictures. So uh, this is in the UK. Uh, the young people had graduated pays in the UK that year. Uh, this is in the USA. This is in Africa, where young people have been trained not simply to study the, the Bible, but how to share and teach the Bible, which is fantastic. That's happening in schools. A young lady who became a Christian through the PAYS team, she followed them around, and now she works with the young people uh, in the favelas in Brazil. This is Clem and Hanani. I always love their story. Clem came on PAYS, went back, did youth ministry so well when he went back with this new methodology that his pastor gave him a wife. And now uh, Clem and Hanani, uh, they lead PAYS uh, and doing a great job in India, which is wonderful. This is in Pakistan, in Islamabad. Um, never expected in my life that we would be reaching into Islamabad. This is the, the team pre-COVID. This is post-COVID. This happened just a few weeks ago. Um, they put on a, a Bible course to teach young people this new methodology of studying the Bible. They hope to get about 40. I think about 143 turned up. And last time I spoke to our national director, uh, they were expecting to train about 700 teenagers in Islamabad. So schools work works. It's an incredible thing. And there are various reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that Christians who converted uh, to God, uh, how many of them did so by the age of 18? Well, the answer is 94%. So 94% of Christians became Christians by the age of 18. So let's think about that for a moment. 90% of American teenagers are in schools and we don't have to um, pay for the buildings, we don't have to pay staff, we don't have to pay for the electric bills. It's a fantastic opportunity. In fact, in the UK, there's actually a law that says all schools, public schools, have to have a daily act of Christian worship. And if they can't find someone in the school to do it, a teacher, they have to look outside. So you would imagine wouldn't you? That every church in the UK has a major emphasis on schools ministry. And I'd love that to be the case. The question is, why don't we? Is it something to do with our religion? Is it something to do with we've maybe misunderstood what Jesus wanted? And how has that affected the gospel or the way we embrace the gospel? Um, so last week we introduced this whole theme of being Christian-centric, which is to pursue our vision, do it God's way, so that God gives us what we want, and kingdom-centric, which is to pursue God's kingdom, do it God's way, so we give him what he wants. The question, of course, becomes, what does God want? What is it that God wants? If we're here to give him what he wants, and that's to be our primary concern, what is it that he actually wants? Well, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3-6 to six says, This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants repentance. 
He wants all people to repent. But do we understand what repentance actually is? And um, probably the best lesson I ever had in this was from my eldest son. When he was around about, I'm, I'm going to say, five or six years old. Uh, and I was in my office. I came back. So I came back from church to my office. I went upstairs and looked at my computer and it was full of pink Sharpie. It was scribbles everywhere. They were on the screen. It was on the casing. It was on the keyboard. I thought, I'm going to kill him. I thought, I won't accuse him because that's what the devil does. But I'll put on my dad's voice. And if he cries, I know he's done it. So I went, Joel. Come to my office, please. It's pretty good, that, isn't it? Debbie's, Debbie's a little bit scared. And there was, there was nothing happened, and there was a gap, and then there was a little bit of a whimper, and then a crying and full-out wailing. Now, Joel was downstairs uh, with his Auntie Lisa and Auntie Helen and Auntie Julie, who were spawning him rotten, playing with his brother. And when I said, come upstairs, he started crying. By the time he got up the stairs, he was like, uh, like you know, like when children know their end is nigh, and he's like stammering and he's shivering and he's, I'm so, 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 so sorry, Daddy. I'm so, so, so sorry, Daddy. I didn't mean to do it, Daddy. I didn't write on your computer with my Sharpie, Daddy. So he kind of gave himself away, right? He was super cute. Not very bright, my son. And uh, anyway, so I'm getting more annoyed. And I'm like, Joel, what have you done? You put it, it won't come off, you know. This is a real problem. This isn't even my computer. It's the church's computer. It's God's computer. And I was getting really annoyed. And I got a rag. I said, look, look. And I went like that. And it all came off, which really annoyed me, to be honest with you. <laughs> but what really stunned me was what he did, because he literally went, yippee. And then he skipped out of my office. Well, I'm really annoyed. I'm like, oi, Joel, get back here. Come back, sunshine. So he comes back. He says, what? He said, you still did it. He said, yeah, I know, Dad. But you wiped it all the way. And then he walked away. <laughs> now, you would think that's the, that's the, the lesson, right? You know, the joy. But why was, why was Joel so joyful? He knew I wasn't going to like beat him up or throw him in prison. The reason he was so joyful was he could get back to how he felt things should be. He could get back to his answers who were spawning rotten and play with his brother. And that's really the meaning of repentance. So the English word for repentance doesn't really summarize what God has in mind. The English word for repentance is we turn from our sin. But the word in Hebrew, teshuva, is to turn and return. Turn and return. In fact, Lamentations says, turn us to you, O Adonai, and we will be returned. The question is, turn to what? What is it that we're actually turning to? And that's what I want to talk about, the, the, the real purpose of repentance. What does the kingdom-centric gospel actually look like? Do we turn, but then not return? We're supposed to return to who God created us to be. And we're supposed to return this world to how things ought to be. Um, Jesus gave a really big example of, kind of an extreme example in a parable of turning without returning. Let me read it to you. It's in Matthew 12. When a defiling evil spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts through the desert looking for an oasis, some unsuspecting soul that can be devil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person spotlessly clean but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. That person ends up far worse off than if they'd never got cleaned up in the first place. And Jesus goes on to say, that's what this generation is like. You may think you cleaned out the junk from your lives and gotten ready for God, but you weren't hospitable to my kingdom message. And now all the devils are moving back in. True repentance is not just turning from sin, it's returning to who God created you to be and for the purpose that God created for you. And that is really key. So what is that purpose? Well, we summarize it, or Jesus summarizes it with the word shalom. What does shalom actually mean? Shalom means completeness, soundness, welfare, and peace. In fact, someone said, we call it peace, but it means far more than peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. Uh, the Jews say that the entire Torah is meant for the way of shalom. That's God's purpose, 
to bring the world back to completion and he's recruited you to be part of it. The reason you exist is because God didn't have anybody else exactly like you and he wanted someone exactly like you. There's something unique about your personality, the way you think, the way you are. In any different situation, no one's going to act exactly like me and no one's going to act exactly like you. And God wants someone to be like you. Now, he wants you in the completed sense, aligned with him. That's what his purpose is, to bring back shalom, not just in your life, but in this world. So if that's God's message, if that's his point, um, what are we supposed to do? And what does that actually look like? Well, I'm a very simple person, as you know. Um, I'm not a great theologian, and so I tend to use diagrams because they help me. So let me, let me uh, give you a diagram that helps me understand. Imagine this little black dot is the earth, uh, and the space or the white space is the air or the universe, you might say. Well, John 12, verse 31 says, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. So what we see, of course, in our world is this awful darkness, this influence on the world. And we turn on our TVs and we see it. But when the kingdom of God comes, then suddenly there is light. So when we become born again, the kingdom of God uh, fills us. And then the kingdom of God works out from us, right? More and more of our life comes under the rule of God, which we'll talk about in a minute. And eventually the kingdom advances in us and we become bigger and we have a bigger influence in the darkness of this world. And then we disciple other people and we lead other people to Jesus. And those other people begin to disciple other people. And at some point in the future, we will have shalom. That's the purpose. And Jesus is saying, if you seek first this, if this is your primary concern, you will make an incredible difference. So the question, of course, then becomes, what is the kingdom of God? What does it actually mean? If I go to a church and say, what is the church? Everybody knows, oh, it's not the building, it's the people. Absolutely right. But if I say to them, can you articulate what the kingdom of God is? People can hesitate. Um, I think the kingdom of God is, is that the place you go when you die? Well, the kingdom of God is really a state of being. The, the New Testament Greek word means royalty, rule, realm, or reign. Um, and perhaps the, the best translation of Matthew 6.33, uh, the one I, I like, um, says it this way. And he will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. If you make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Is the kingdom of God your primary concern? Or is it a concern somewhere along the way? When you imagine... What does it look like to seek first the kingdom of God? Well, imagine somewhere you're really familiar with. Imagine your neighborhood or your workplace or your school, your university, your college, wherever it might be. Imagine everything in that place happens the way things happen in heaven. Imagine heaven coming to that place. The way people talk, the way the people honor God, the way the people interact with each other and with him. If things happen on earth the way they are in heaven and that's your primary concern, then you are seeking first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. So what is the gospel? Well, a Christian-centric gospel says Jesus came to rescue you. It's all about you. And, and then we, we say things like, they're not exactly in the Bible, but we say things like, if you were the only person that needed saving, Jesus would have died on the cross for you. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, I don't know. But it makes sense, certainly, in a Christian-centric gospel, which is all about you. A kingdom-centric gospel says, yes, Jesus did come and he did rescue you, but the reason he came was to recruit you. Jesus came to recruit you. And that is a kingdom-centric gospel. And I would encourage you to preach that gospel. You know, a few years ago, I was in a school in Europe. It was a boarding school. And uh, all the staff were Christians, but none of the students were Christians, none of the teenagers. And every Tuesday, there was a chapel service. And I was asked to speak at the chapel service. And I said to them, okay, well, when I, when I preach, if a young person responds to the gospel, you know, do we, what do we do? Do we, do we give them a piece of paper? Do they go somewhere to be prayed for? And their reply was, we don't know because it's not happened yet. So I said, okay, well, I'll preach. I'd love to preach. I'm not the best preacher here, but I'll preach if you allow me to preach a kingdom-centric gospel not a Christian-centric gospel. So I'm not just going to preach that Jesus came to rescue them and their life's bad, and, but if they put their trust in Jesus, he'll fulfill them. I'm going to preach a kingdom-centric gospel. Is that okay? 
And they said yes. I'm going to read out the basis. Um, we have a template on page. It's on our website um, where we, we just written out basically what the gospel is. I'm going to read it to you. So this is basically what I preached. Obviously, I added stories and illustrations, but essentially, this is what I said. Have you ever asked the question, why do I exist? The answer is actually quite simple. You exist because no one exactly like you ever existed before, and God wanted someone exactly like you. You are loved because you were created to be loved. Of course, not everything about you is lovable, is it? We're all flawed and imperfect. In fact, we sometimes need saving from ourselves. Yet when Jesus came to die on the cross, he did not come to simply rescue you, he came to recruit you. He came to invite you to spread his love. God says that the kind of religion that he desires is the kind that looks after orphans and widows in their distress and rejects the evil in the world that pollutes us. If you're prepared to do that, to ask for forgiveness, turn from your sin and follow Jesus, then he will fill you with his love in order that you can bring that love to others. Do you have a sense of that already? A bigger reason to live than just you. If so, can I ask you to return to the person he created you to be and live to advance his kingdom. I shared that gospel. I gave the appeal. Asked young people to stand if they, they wanted to become Christians. Um, three quarters of the teenagers stood. And what was interesting to me was every single boy did. I believe the kingdom-centric gospel is far more powerful. It's what Jesus taught. He told people from the very beginning, this is what I'm inviting you into. The, the kingdom of God, to advance the kingdom of God. And yet we've made it so much more like a consumer product. Jesus came to make your life better. He's certainly made my life better. But he's done far more, far more I should say, than that. What about you? So let's just very briefly unpack. What does it look like? How do we know? And why do we sometimes just settle to be rescued? So let's start with rescued. Let me ask a question. When is the gospel not the gospel? My answer would be when it's only half the gospel. When Jesus taught, he mainly spoke to believers. And all these parables were aimed at believers about things they didn't yet understand about their religion. He tells the parable of the sower. So the parable of the sower is basically about the four types of hearers when you hear the message of the kingdom of God. I'll go through them really briefly with you, um, but the, the details are in the book if you're interested. So the first is the path. And these are those who don't perceive the kingdom. They don't quite get it. They don't quite understand what the gospel is really about. And then he talks about those who don't pursue the kingdom. So they're really excited. Oh, Jesus came for me. Uh, that, that part they get, oh, I'm saved uh, through justification by faith. Fantastic. I don't need to earn my way. That's wonderful. But when things get difficult, when things get hard, uh, they don't pursue the kingdom because it's only really about them. And then we have those who don't prioritize, described on the thorny ground. They don't prioritize. So bad things happen, there are worries of this life that choke uh, the kingdom message out of them. The wealth, the worries and the wealth of this life, the opportunities they get, the other things they could do become so important to them, so fantastic to them that the kingdom basically is just left and choked. But Jesus says a time is coming when the true worshippers will worship God in spirit and in truth and they will be, as he describes here, the good soil, and the good soil promotes the kingdom. The good soil advances the kingdom. So which of the two gospels have you embraced? When you think about those four types of hearers, which one best describes you? And if we move to being a person who understands they're recruited, what would that look like? What would it look like to know that you are recruited? Well, here's another question. When is the gospel good news? When it brings out the good in people. When it brings out the kingdom dynamics, the kingdom principles in people. So I want to finish by telling a couple of stories really. And the first is the story of two communities. Um, Lynn and I lived in uh, Moston in Manchester. It's quite a difficult place to live in, in the sense there's quite a lot of crime. In fact, afterwards, a few years ago, we found out it was one of the most deprived parts of the UK. Uh, we saw a lot of bad things uh, happen. Um, one day, for instance, this came through my door. It was a leaflet describing a boy called Robert. And there was a little map on it. And it said all the things, the bad things he'd done. He was probably about 14 years old at the time. All the bad things he'd done. And here was the area he wasn't allowed to go out of. 
in England we call that an antisocial behaviour order. It's like a house arrest. And on the bottom of this sheet it said, here's what you can do. Here's what you can do to help the problem. It basically says, if you see him outside of the area, give us a call and we'll lock him away. But don't worry, we won't tell anybody it was you. You could describe this leaflet in, in three words. We give up. Um, this young lady, uh, Suzanne Kappa, she was um, kidnapped. She was 16 years old. She was kidnapped. She was murdered. She was tortured uh, for a week. Her teeth were taken out while she was alive and gasoline was poured on her. She was burnt alive. Uh, before she died, she was dumped in South Manchester. Before she died, she managed to crawl to a road. Uh, an ambulance came and before she passed away, she told the, the um, police exactly what had happened to her and who had done it. So then they showed the pictures of the killers. Well, my wife, uh, Lynn, knew the, the killers because she used to go to their house to cut their hair. They showed a picture of the thing that was used to torture uh, Suzanne and Lynn had seen that in the house. In fact, they'd moved it off the wall for her to get space to cut their hair. We, we knew then that our next door neighbor was the grandfather of the killers. And as bad as all that was, as shocking as that was, what really affected me was the fact that I realised when they showed a picture of the house where Suzanne had been tortured for a week that I'd walk past that house every day that week four times to my church office and back for lunch, to my church office and back in the evening, completely unaware of what was happening. Just like you're unaware of what was going on in the houses you drove past to get here today. So the government decided, well, we're going to pour money. I told you this story last, last, uh, last episode, that we're going to pour money into the area. They rebuilt our house, if you remember. And the reason they poured money into the area was reported by the, the Manchester Evening News, which is a, a popular newspaper in Manchester. And it said this. Ministers say that identifying poorer areas in this way will improve their knowledge of where to provide money. Six years later, and they knocked the whole place down. They rebuilt the area. This is not the before, this is the after photo. You can see the metal railings up, people have moved out. The area was worse than it was before. Sure, they poured in money, they rebuilt our house, they fixed all the people's houses, but the devils moved back in again. They didn't fix the real problem because the real answer is not money. The real answer is the gospel. At the same time, uh, we, we took on a church, Lynn and I led a church and, and Matt was involved in the church and, and we were told by the police, the worst area is a place called Dean Street. If you can do anything about Dean Street, that'd be great because the problem with Dean Street was that the gangs used to move in and people used to hide in the homes. But now what's happening is that the gangs knock on the door, they come into the house, the people move upstairs and the gangs just go through the place. It's awful. They shoot up with the, the needles, the drugs, they raid the fridges, they use the TVs and they leave early hour in the morning. If you can do anything about that, please do. Well, we, we recruited some people, we worked with some other organisations and we recruited people to move into the area. Mark was one of them, he moved into the area. We did youth work and ministry and we brought the gospel, the kingdom century gospel and it changed the community. Eventually, um, we got an award from a kind of government agency because in fact, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, we partnered with an organisation called uh, Eden. And then what I loved was the fact that the, that the area changed so much that the government, local government, built a park. And when they asked the community, what should we call the park, uh, the police told me, well, we surveyed and the idea that the, the main popular uh, name that came back from the residents was, can you call it the Eden Garden? Now, local government, for political reasons, said no, but that's apparently what I was told uh, they would call it. That's the difference, right? The difference between just money and the actual gospel. Now, God is not probably calling you to move from your house to another area. That's not what this is about. But however you advance the kingdom of God is going to be difficult. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to be hard work. And other people are going to give up. Other people, that, that message is going to be choked out of them through wealth, opportunities, or pressure. I was thinking this morning, how many people I know have given up because they panicked when things were bad and they didn't wait for the good things to come back around again. But there's, and I know this is the wrong phrase, but there's a kind of fairy dust that God sprinkles on us to help us in those times, okay? And that fairy dust doesn't help us, doesn't help things become easier, but it helps us become more effective. That fairy dust is why me, 
I would consider myself a below average person can help average people do above average things. And why maybe in my life, God has done above average things. So the question is, what attracts that kind of fairy dust? And what is it really? Before we do that, let me tell you one last story. Uh, I, I was born with a full set of grandparents and I had a favourite. I know you shouldn't, but I did. He was called Grandpops. And he always used to make me laugh. This is a picture of me and Grandpops when I was a little baby. Um, I was young once. And uh, he was super funny. He would do anything to make us laugh. I really, really loved him. He had a really sweet and soft heart. Um, when I backslid and I came back to God, very soon after that, he was diagnosed with cancer. He lived in London. I lived in uh, Manchester. I went to see him. And he was afraid. I'd never seen him afraid before. And he said, Paul, I know I'm dying. Um, I know you're a Christian. What should I do? Now, I, I can speak to, and I have done spoke to thousands with no nerves, but speak to my family is different. I don't know why, it just is. And so I did what most people do when they're afraid. I didn't run away. I just did something similar to what I should have done, but not what I should have done. So I took my Bible and I gave it and said, well, Grandpops, if you read this, and I turn to a passage, it'll tell you what to do. Because I was kind of almost embarrassed or felt awkward. I don't know what it was. She said, thank you. And I went back to Manchester. Well, a week later, I get a letter. Thank you, Paul. It's the nicest gift anybody's ever given me, but I still don't understand it and I'm still afraid. And I just felt so convicted and I thought, I need to go back, it's ridiculous. So I made plans to go back a few days later. But just before I was going back, my mum woke me up early in the morning to tell me he'd passed away. So I go to his funeral, I walk into the church uh, graveyard and my grandmother comes up to me, she gives me a big hug. She's crying her eyes out and she says, Paul, where is he? So I want to say, don't worry, Gran, he's in heaven because he said this prayer and he meant it in his heart. And I don't know exactly what heaven's like, but let me describe some of the wonderful things about it. I could have comforted her. In actual fact, what I did was this. I don't know, Gran. I don't know where he is. There's a little bit of hope that somehow he found God and, and by God's Holy Spirit, he led him, but I, I have no assurance of that. And, and here's my kind of final point. Tag your it. Tag your it. In that moment, I would like to have said, oh, oh Grandpa's talked to my pastor, he'll tell you, but no, you're, you're the person, you're God's person in that college, in that school, in that workplace. Tag, you're it. So which of the Gospels have you embraced? Did Jesus simply come to rescue you? Or have you understood that Jesus came to recruit you? And if you have, please share that Gospel with those you teach about Jesus. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. In the description below is the Kingdom Centric Workshop. And while you're there, go ahead and hit subscribe.